Hi everyone. Um, uh, I am resuming my 1973 series with the film Electric Glide in Blue. It was directed by a guy named Jane William Guerrico, I believe. Um, he doesn't have any other credits as a director. He's primarily a musician, composed music for television shows. Um, but uh, this is a film that he directed. Uh, Electric Glide in Blue intrigued me mostly because of its title. I thought it was a very cool sounding title. As it turns out, Electric Glide is the name of a motorcycle. And blue, of course, stands for police officer. So it's about a patrolman in Arizona uh, who is riding around on his bike basically all day long. Um, he, the main character is uh, named John Wintergreen. He's played by Robert Blake, um, who is probably best known uh, for um, playing sort of intimidating characters in his later career, especially um, the mysterious person who can be in two places at once in the David Lynch movie um, Lost Highway. He's had, of course, some legal problems since then, um, but uh, he was pretty uh, young when he made this film, of course. Uh, he's an aspiring uh, homicide detective. Uh, he really wants to get off the bike, doesn't like having to ride around it in the hot Arizona uh, sun all day long, wants to be a homicide detective and investigate crimes rather than just write tickets and things like that. Um, he kind of sort of has a partner <laughs> whose uh, 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 nickname is Zipper. Um, I'm not really familiar with most of the actors in this movie except for uh, um, a homicide detective called Harv Poole who's played by an actor named Mitchell Ryan. He played General McAllister, uh, the head of the bad guys in the first Lethal Weapon movie. He was also um, Fletcher Reed's boss in Liar Liar. you probably remember him in that board meeting after uh, Jim Carrey can't help but insult him to his face. And he goes, <laughs> that's the funniest thing I've ever heard in my life. You're a real card, Reed. That's what we sort of think we need around here. A little reverence. Ha ha ha. You're that guy. Um, <laughs> so um, he is um, the guy who uh, uh, Wintergreen obviously wants to be. And when Wintergreen comes across a um, what he thinks is a crime scene, uh, old guy living in a shack, dead in his bathtub with this giant shotgun wound through his middle, and it looks like he did it himself, except that something doesn't quit, sit quite right. Um, why didn't the guy um, shoot himself in the head rather than in his chest? He could end up bleeding for hours and really draw out his pain. Um, and also, why are there two stakes sitting over there on the table instead of just one? Um, and he argues with the, um, uh, Wintergreen argues with the homicide detective that comes in to investigate. Uh, and of course, um, the guy, um, the, uh, the detective just thinks he's a wannabe, but um, Harv Poole actually does listen to him and say, okay, well, uh, let's do an autopsy and take a better look. And sure enough, as it turns out, the guy already had a bullet in him when he died and someone tried to make it look like he killed himself to cover that up, figured, oh, the guy just killed himself so we don't need to do an autopsy. But when they do the autopsy, they find out that it actually is a murder. So once that happens, Poole says to Wintergreen, Wintergreen, I want you to partner up with me. You know, I want you to drive with me, and we're going to investigate this together. And when that happens, Wintergreen's like, excellent, gets the suit, gets the boots, gets the hat. You know, they all wear like these um, Stetson hats um, and gets to ride around a car. No more motorcycle for him. He's really happy about that. But he's not an experienced detective, um, so uh, he ends up not treating suspects the way, <laughs> uh, the most effective way to get information. He doesn't like the fact that Poole will beat up someone or intimidate them or threaten them in order to get information, but clearly that's more effective than what he does, which is just, anybody seen this guy? Seen this guy? No? Okay, thanks very much for your time. That doesn't really work. <laughs> um, so uh, since the movie was called Electric Glide in Blue, I kind of figured at some point he's not going to be able to be a homicide detective anymore. He's going to go back to wearing the uniform and back on the motorcycle again, and I was right about that. Um, I didn't really like this movie very much, actually. Um, it starts out really well, actually. And there's an interesting subplot involving a woman that uh, Wintergreen is seeing named Jolene. Uh, she's played by an actress named um, Janine Ryan. I really don't know anything else about her. Um, but when um, Poole and Wintergreen are riding around together, they stop at the bar where she's working, and it's after closing, she's, she's there alone. And, uh, he, and Poole says to her, come on, babe, let's go. And it's clear from that point that he thinks he is her man, but in fact, she's been seeing Wintergreen uh, as well. And she ends up taunting Poole quite a lot. This long scene in which she sort of dances around in the jukebox, teasing the both of them. And neither one of them are saying anything. Neither of the cops are just sitting there going, damn, you know, and, and Wintergreen's like, damn, I don't want to piss off my new partner right here. You know, he's this experienced homicide detective. I don't know what I'm going to do now. And she's just rubbing in, in both their faces. She says to Poole, she says, 
wintergreen can can do it like three times in the morning whereas you can't do it at all and you know so that's a really good scene i like that a lot unfortunately everything that happens after that scene is terrible it's like someone wrote the script up until that point and then for whatever reason didn't finish it couldn't finish it some they gave it to somebody else and the guy didn't know where the story was go was supposed to go and so he just wrote a bunch of scenes trying to resolve all the different conflicts as best as he can one scene after another of characters just sort of talking things out and drawing conclusions and then turning out to be right. Um, and, and just one scene after another of this is just terrible, just terrible. Um, they shouldn't have even made the movie if they couldn't finish the script with the original guy. Uh, or maybe they did and the guy just didn't know what he was doing. I don't know. But it's just like the first half of the movie is really good and the second half is terrible. You know, it's just, it just doesn't work at all. Um, and then there's the ending of the movie, the very ending of the movie, which is just one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. Imagine, if you will, a camera move that starts in on something, the subject of the shot, and then pulls away. You've seen that before, haven't you? Well, this shot pulls away and away and farther away and farther away and farther away and, and she keeps going like that for three and a half minutes. It just keeps going farther away for no reason whatsoever, it seems. And then after three and a half minutes, the, it, it freezes. On, on one frame and just stays that way. And then the image slowly changes from color to black and white. It takes another two and a half minutes for that to happen. It goes on and on and on and on. And finally, after, you know, six minutes of this one sh image right here, finally the credits roll and, and the movie is over. I'm just like, you've got to be kidding me. Who thought that this was a good idea? Hmm, this is probably the worst film that I've seen in this 1973 series. Oh, it's just terrible. And it was so disappointing because the first half of the movie was so good. <laughs> oh, man. This is Chase. It's kind of stupid. It really just sticks out. You know, the whole motorcycle chase where the cops are chasing a another gang. They're pursuing this one guy. There's all kind of crashes. It's just like something out of Smoking the Bandit. It's just completely out of place. And a lot of those final dialogue scenes just like, just sort of force, force resolution in, in, in different various ways. You know, one guy starts shooting around for no reason at all. So Robert Blake has to pull his gun and shoot him and kill him. Um, and it's just, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, a whole bunch of scenes like that. Just, they're just so amateurish. It's amazing the movie even exists. Anyway, um, obviously I wasn't a studio executive back then, so I would have called them on that if I had been. But uh, yeah, they're like, oh yeah, it's cool, whatever. Yeah, it's so different. I'm like, it doesn't work. It just, it doesn't work. It's very, very sloppy. So a strong disc recommendation for Electro Glide in Blue, unfortunately. Uh, it's a real shame. I didn't even like this movie as much as the Bond movie, <laughs> which I thought was pretty bad too. Thank you for watching. I'll have a couple more 1973 uh, videos uh, for you very soon. Thanks again. Uh, oh, and uh, uh, hello to uh, Harry Benson, who I know has been enjoying this series very much. And, and all of you, really. Thank you very much for, for commenting. Oh, when you do comment, please go over to my Facebook page. That's the best place for me to respond to you. Link's in the description. Appreciate it very much. Later.